Lithuania's president warns of a Russian invasion. Is Eastern Europe really under threat by Vladimir Putin? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is the NATO alliance. Dalia Gribuskaite says her country should be prepared for a political or technological attack and a full-scale war if more NATO troops don't come soon. For Lithuania's leader, the proof is in the numbers. She says Russian soldiers on the border with the Baltics are 10 times stronger than NATO forces there. And her concerns are shared with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. He says his organization needs to adapt in the face of a more assertive Kremlin, citing the conflict in Ukraine, troops in Moldova, and a history of aggression with Georgia. Now, Norway is also asking for help. So, as European countries along Russia's border bolster their defenses, could the region be on the cusp of a new Cold War? Natalie Pohonen reports. Norway is a land of fjords, reindeer, small towns, and home of the Nobel Peace Prize. But could it also be the nation about to trigger a European arms race? Well, Russia says the NATO member might be heading there. Currently, 330 US Marines are on rotation in Vernes for training. Oslo is asking the US to send 700 soldiers next year and to station them at Sethermön, a lot closer to the Russian border. Moscow says that plan undermines trust between it and Oslo. On Facebook, the Russian embassy said, this makes Norway less predictable and could cause growing tensions, triggering an arms race and destabilizing the situation in Northern Europe. We see it as clearly unfriendly and it will not remain free of consequence. The Norwegian government says the decision is about training and improving winter fighting capability. But it's clear the Russians are wary of what's happening next door with its Nordic neighbor. NATO allies have been putting on a show of force in the Baltic region in recent years with exercises like this one in Lithuania earlier in June. The group's military presence in Eastern Europe has been building ever since Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. At a recent meeting of the NATO members known as the Bucharest Nine, leaders called for the alliance to consider boosting its presence in their region. They say Russia's multifaceted, destabilizing actions and policies and its aggressive behavior threatens the vision of a Europe at peace. Lithuania's president, Dalia Gryaputskaita, told Der Spiegel, The likelihood of Russian invasion is high if we don't constantly defend ourselves. If we demonstrate that we are able and willing to defend ourselves, no one will attack us. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, says, NATO's military buildup and growing military activities near the Russian and Belarusian borders require special attention. In October, NATO members, as well as Sweden and Finland, will head to Norway for a military exercise called Trident Juncture. It's going to be the group's largest drill since 2002, with about 40,000 personnel taking part. NATO says its aim is not to isolate Russia, but it will continue to have a defense and deterrence approach towards it. So does Russia warrant the military posturing and how will it react if there are extra boots in its neighborhood? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Let's bring in our guests now. In Washington, D.C., we have William Courtney. He's a former U.S. ambassador and White House advisor on Russian and Eastern European affairs. In London, former Kremlin advisor Alexander Nekrasov. And also in London, Ian Bond. He's a former British diplomat who worked both in NATO and in Moscow and is now Director of Foreign Policy at the Center for European Reform. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Alexander Nekrasov, let me start with you. Is Russia a danger to the Baltics and Eastern Europe? Well, of course not, because Russia would never attack any country which is a member of NATO. It's a very simple logic. If you attack one NATO country, all the rest go against you. 
So this is a made-up allegation. This suits uh, the Western countries because they have um, built up their troops on the borders with Russia. They are posing the greatest danger. And to be honest with you, after what happened in Ukraine, where uh, the government was overthrown with the help, finances, and support of the West, uh, and then the West uh, accused Russia of aggression and taking over the East Ukraine and Crimea, that is absolutely absurd. You can't lie to your own people, forgetting the most recent history. You can't rewrite history like that. And don't forget another thing. Russia disbanded the uh, Warsaw Pact in good faith, and uh, the West tricked uh, uh, Russia, uh, and NATO stayed on. And not okay. only stayed on, it broke its promise right. that NATO would move eastwards, and it, it moved eastwards. Right. Okay. So Ian Bond, that's one side of the story. That's the Russian narrative. NATO's the one doing the encroaching. NATO's the one doing the provoking, not Russia. Do you agree with any of that? Well, not surprisingly, no, I don't. I mean, first of all, if one looks at the current situation, Russia has about 400,000 troops in its western military district. That's the part of Russia which faces uh, the Baltic states and Poland and um, uh, that, that area. And uh, NATO has, if you include the, the forces of the Baltic states themselves, as well as NATO's reinforcements, uh, something of the order of 15,000. So I think, you know, to say that uh, NATO's 15,000 troops are a threat to Russia's 400,000 would really be rather surprising. And in terms of the history, I'm afraid what Alexander Nekrasov has said is complete nonsense. I mean, the fact is that Russia annexed Crimea. That's the first uh, seizure of territory from another country in Europe that has taken place since the Second World War and its forces are deployed in eastern Ukraine. And I'm afraid the problem is that uh, Russian troops in eastern Ukraine keep uh, posting on Russian social media networks, so it's pretty easy to see when they have moved from their bases in Russia to places in, uh, in eastern Ukraine. Right. So it simply doesn't carry any credibility to suggest that uh, NATO's making this stuff up. Okay, I'm gonna give you a right of reply Mr. Nekrasov, you're going to get an opportunity to reply to that. But let me bring in uh, Ambassador Courtney for the moment. In general, the Latvians, the Estonians, the Lithuanians, and even the likes of the Norwegians, do they have cause for concern? Is there good reason for why they're so nervous about Russia and asking the West for more help? Uh, yes. Uh, in the past, it has not been possible to predict uh, Russian military actions. For example, prior to 2014, no one in the West really expected Russia to seize and annex Crimea, uh, much less to in invade eastern Ukraine and carry out a war which is still being fought. The Russian mercenaries and, and pro-Russian separatists there are still fighting it and killing Ukrainians. Uh, the Russians have established a new military command for the Arctic and also one for the Black Sea. So from the standpoint of the Baltics, uh, Poland, uh, Norway, Scandinavia, for them, it's not easy to predict what Russia's next move is going to be. So they do have genuine perceptions that the threat is increasing. Alexander Nekrasov, Russia's unpredictable, and given the body of evidence over the recent years, these countries have cause for concern because they don't want to be swallowed up. Isn't that fair? Well, it's not fair, simply because uh, if anyone is the aggressor, it's usually the Americans uh, and the British are helping them to accuse Russia when the, the West has been invading other countries uh, openly or quietly. It's just absurd. And, and, and notice that both speakers did not mention the coup that happened in Ukraine and overturned a legitimate democratic regime. Notice that they don't talk about it. They cut this piece of history off and start talking what happened afterwards. But afterwards was caused by that coup that was funded and organized by the West. You can't change history like that and expect that people who know history will fall for that cheap propaganda. This is cheap propaganda. This is not proper debate. This is just, you know, uh, t t t talking about events the way you want them to be seen and not the way the world sees this event. So, no, I don't buy these arguments at all.
Okay, Ian Bond, Western meddling, particularly from Mr. Nekrasov's perspective with regards, Mr. Yanukovych and Ukraine, at the root cause of everything, are you ignoring half of the story, Ian? Certainly not. I mean, the reason that I didn't mention the coup is partly for the sense of brevity and partly because there wasn't a coup. Uh, if one wants to, to rewrite history, then the Russian narrative that there was a coup is a pretty good example. Uh, we actually had uh, an agreement brokered by the, um, where are you, French, German, Polish foreign ministers with a representative of the Russian president and President Yanukovych, uh, the Russians refused to sign that agreement at the last minute, and Yanukovych fled from Kiev before the, uh, before the agreement could be implemented. That's not a coup. That's a president running out on his own country. Uh, and in those circumstances, I think the Ukrainians have done very well to uh, rebuild a state and a, a democratic system in the intervening years while under constant attack from Moscow. Okay. And let's, I just want to park that off now, for now, if, if you all don't mind, because I'll put Ukraine away for the moment and look at some of the tensions now. Um, I want to ask you, William Courtney, is it necessary, is it wise for NATO and its allies to conduct all of these drills in the Baltic Sea? There's a big one coming up in October, Trident Juncture, Sweden, Finland, NATO all together. Is it wise to antagonize Russia in this way and only make them sharpen sharpen their weapons for possible conflict because they feel you're on our border and you're messing with us. Uh, for NATO forces to be able effectively to deter Russian aggression, it's necessary that they carry out training and exercises to show that they can work together to find whatever deficiencies there may be in the forces and repair those. So exercises are a critically important part of NATO activity. They are certainly important in the Baltic region. Uh, Sweden and Finland have seen increased concerns about Russian threats. Of course, Norway has asked to double the number of U.S. Uh, Marines there from 350 to 700. Uh, in the Black Sea, uh, NATO, with uh, some basing uh, on a rotational basis of air forces in uh, Romania, is carrying out additional activities to try to deter Russian aggression in that theater as well. So. Exercises and training are important. Okay, so Mr. Nekrasov, they want Western help because they're frightened. They have an existential threat when it comes to Russia. Well, it's all provocations. Now, let me tell you something. All these war games by NATO are intended as a provocation and baiting Russia. Now, let me tell uh, your two guests. The next world war will be nuclear. So you can practice all your marine operations, all your wonderful ships and so on. You, this is meaningless. This will be a nuke war. So please remember that when you start uh, provoking Russia and doing the silly war games all over the place. And don't forget also that the country that has the most military bases abroad is America, all over the world. Russia has a, you know, one, two, three bases. That is it. So please don't start telling that Russia is, ag is, is the aggressor when you've covered the whole world with bases, when your military budget is more than the next seven countries after you, and you are telling that Russia is the aggressor. You know, you sound childish, and you sound uninformed as well, because you don't understand what the modern conflict is all about, okay, military so war. Okay, so, so you don't understand. Okay, you talk enough. about silly things like okay. war games. Okay, talk about silly things. I mean, Ian Bond, we have Mr. Nekrasov saying, you know, be careful, the next war will be nuclear, so these war games will almost be meaningless in, in some ways when it comes to nuclear bombs. Let me allow you to address that, but also fold in uh, something to think about here. The former Ost uh, Estonian president, recently saying that Russia would lose St. Petersburg if it dared to attack the region. Are we finding kind of reckless talk on both sides at the moment? Well, I, I, I haven't seen where, I presume that's Thomas Hendrik Ilves. I haven't seen yes. where he had said that, but um, I can't believe that he meant that seriously. Um, but in response to uh, Alexander Nekrasov's point, 
Um, I think it's extraordinarily irresponsible to start talking about nuclear war in the, these rather offhand terms. Uh, the fact is that both sides carry out military exercises because if you don't want to find yourself in a position where you feel you have no option but to resort to your nuclear deterrent, you need your conventional forces to be in good order. And you need to be able to demonstrate to people who you believe wish you ill that your conventional forces are in good order. Russia does that. We do that. China does that. Every power does that. And it would be extraordinary if they didn't. Uh, but to go from that to say, we're going to have a world war and it's going to be a nuclear war and you should stop your silly war games, I find extraordinarily irresponsible. Mr. Nekrasov, the fact that Russia wishes these countries ill is a valid reason for them to want to protect themselves. Well, it's all made up. You know, the Baltics, if you look at their history, they were always uh, telling things that didn't really mean anything, didn't exist anything. Don't forget these three Baltic states were fighting on the side of Hitler's armies. And uh, so n let's not forget all of these things as well. And all this rhetoric is meaningless, meaningless. And I, and I caution uh, my colleagues that, that saying, oh, it's irresponsible to talk about nuclear war. This is exactly what's going to happen. And that is why it is so dangerous to, 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 to provoke uh, countries like Russia and like China as well, by the way, because the West is now provoking China as well over the, the islands. So you, you must understand, they have to be responsible themselves. They have to stop inventing all these fairy tales about somebody attacking the Baltics, for example, when everybody knows you do not attack a member of NATO because you have to deal with other NATO members. Clause 5. Don't okay. you remember so, that? Okay, so, so let which me, country okay, would be th th that's a good point. to do this? Okay, so, William Courtney, all for one and one for all, an attack on one is an attack on all. Realistically speaking, if Russia was to attack a Baltic nation, do you think NATO would have the political will? Yes, it's on paper that they have to come to the defense of any NATO member. Do you think that they would have the political will to get involved in an all-out war with Russia? Well, first, let me thank Mr. Nekrasov. Uh, twice he has indicated how important NATO is as an alliance in terms of defending its own members. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, yes, a key reason uh, why training and exercises are carried out is to show countries in NATO that participate that NATO is, in fact, committed to their defense. If NATO trains and exercises to protect its members, that's the most credible thing it can do to show its members that it will come to their defense in an extreme situation. Ian Bond, we have Mr. Nekrasov saying that this is all nonsense, that it's all made up, that the, you know, the pretexts uh, with regards Russia wishing any of these countries ill, that's all, you know, complete rubbish. Let me ask you from your perspective, what do you think they're thinking? If Russia wishes Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe ill or the Baltic nations ill or the Scandinavian nations ill, why are they doing that? Is it to create a dent in the NATO alliance? Well, it's been a traditional aim, first of all, of the Soviet Union and subsequently of Russia to divide and weaken its, uh, its opponents. Um, but Russia still thinks very much in terms of spheres of influence. Uh, what the current prime minister, then President uh, Medvedev, described as Russia's zone of privileged interest, uh, which basically meant that Russia felt that it has the right to tell countries on, it, on its borders what they can and can't do in a foreign policy sense. Uh, that's something which is, uh, you know, at least these days, alien to uh, most European countries. Uh, they believe that countries like the Baltic states, or for that matter, like Ukraine or Georgia, have the right to determine for themselves what direction they should take in their foreign policy. But that, I think, is fundamentally why the Baltic states feel under threat. And one thing I have to challenge, Mr. Nekrasov claimed that they fought on the side of the Nazis. I mean, that is an outright lie. What actually happened was that first the Soviet Union invaded them in 1940. 
Then Nazi Germany invaded them in 1941, and then the Soviet Union invaded them again in 1944 and occupied them until 1991. And with that sort of history, it's not entirely surprising that they feel that they face a bit of a threat from, from their eastern neighbour and want to find support from other democratic countries uh, to stand up to any threats that might come from the east. Okay, so Mr. Nekrasov, the fact that you felt the need to remind our viewers that these guys were Nazi collaborators when the story doesn't quite check out that way, doesn't it give all the more reason for them to fear you because they feel demonized by you? No, these three republics were fascist states when the Soviet army moved in. And that is not said, me telling, that is the report of the Joint Committee of the House of Commons uh, of the British Parliament after it visited three republics in 1938 and 39. So uh, they were already fascist regimes that were playing games with everyone. So I'm telling the right story. The, the, the wrong story is told by the Western diplomats and historians. Unfortunately, this idea of uh, turning Russia into uh, an enemy is very simple. It is because America and its allies in NATO, Western allies, are the real aggressors. Look at Iraq, look at Libya, look at Syria, look at their interference everywhere else. Look at Yemen being destroyed completely to the ground with Western munitions while everybody looks the other way. And uh, anywhere you look, everywhere you look, the Western meddling has destroyed whole nations, has created a migration crisis that has never been before seen in the history of the world. Mr. De and they are telling us that it's Russia. Mr. That's De Krasov. unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, but you don't believe that Russian intervention in, for example, Syria hasn't also created a migrant crisis, that Russia's not also getting its hands very, R very Russian dirty? Russian intervention. Ex Excuse me, Russian intervention, first of all, it was invited by the sure. government. Which by is Bashar al-Assad, who's responsible for and, uh, the deaths no, of about no, no, 400,000 no, no. Syrians. Excuse me, but he is, accepted, he is accepted by the UN. And what are the Americans, the French and the British are doing there? Nobody knows, but nobody called them there, you see? But they are meddled in every country, and every time they meddle, there is a serious problem. And that is why I can't understand this language. You know, you create a problem and then you find and, and try to blame somebody for that problem. America is the biggest aggressor in this century to claim that Russia is a danger. Russia has lost influence in all of the neighboring countries because of interference from the West. To say that it's the aggressor, it's a lie. It's a lie. It, it, it's just changing the, not just the course of history. It's changing yesterday's events uh, uh, to suit these agendas. Okay. And I can't really understand how a former diplomat and, and an advisor to the White House can simply, you know, mix things up and, and present a sort of a uh, scenario which suits them. Okay. It's unbelievable. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Courtney, we've got about 20, 25, 30 seconds left on this segment. Final response from you, sir. The West has an interest in Russia's being at peace with its neighbors. The West has given strong support to the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of all states of the former Soviet Union. Russian aggression in Georgia in 2008, in Ukraine beginning in 2014, has posed a challenge to European security arrangements that are unlike anything that has happened before since the end of World War II. There are mechanisms such as the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe where these issues can be discussed, but until the Russians make a decision to pull out of eastern Ukraine and end the war there, the West is going to remain pretty united in sanctions and opposition to, Western, uh, to Russian aggression in Ukraine. Mr. Nekrasov, the point that the other two men seem to be making here is that Russia doesn't like the fact that the Lithuanians, the Estonians, and others want to decide their own foreign policy. They want to decide who they want to ally with or align with. So if they want to be pro-Western, that automatically means Russia will be antagonistic with them. That's the truth, isn't it? No, it's not the truth, simply because, first of all, uh, let me be blunt about this. The free uh, republics, uh, the, the Baltics, they are insignificant players in Europe. Nobody really cares what's happening there. Their economies are collapsing. 
They thought they will join the EU and be provided by with finances, but uh, the Russian tourists have stopped going there and they're basically falling apart. You, you must understand, the economy of the West is crumbling. It's falling apart. Their interest rates are at zero level, which means they, this is a crisis. They are hiding this crisis with false statistics and uh, with lies, with, Estonia, with blaming I mean, other countries I mean, sorry for to interrupt aggression. You, but Estonia seems to be a, a pretty solid economy. It seems to be, you know, compact little country, but doing oh, really no, well. No, no, no. No, no, all the, all the free republics, I know ma many people from them, they're all in the West now. They said it's impossible to live there. The prices are too high, corruption is unbelievably bad. But it, it sounds like you're talking about Russia. They joined. No, 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 I'm, I'm talking to people from these free republics. And they tell me the situation on the ground is terrible. And uh, they're trying to leave, they're running away from it. So if these countries are losing their population, why is that that they are saying, you know, uh, why do you think they are saying they're in danger? Okay. Because they have to hide that fact. Okay. Ian Bond, does any of that sound appealing to you? Uh, that is just such a joke. Uh, I mean, Riga is um, flourishing, and it's flourishing in part because of the number of Russians who choose to put their money uh, there, sometimes their families there, to buy apartments in the city or houses at the seaside outside Riga. Um, and they're doing that because they think that they want to have somewhere that they can get away to when the situation in Russia gets too much for them. Uh, the fact is that the economies of the three Baltic states suffered, yes, quite badly during the economic crisis, as indeed pretty much everybody's economy did. But they've been growing pretty healthily and are still growing pretty healthily at the moment. Um, and uh, it is quite remarkable how many members even of the elite and uh, those who surround President Putin find it convenient to spend part of their summer in the, uh, the seaside resort of Yurmala just outside Riga. Right. So it's complete nonsense to talk about collapsing economies and people running away. Let me take a slight twist here, William Courtney, and look at the commander-in-chief in the White House. He's not too keen on NATO. He keeps on talking about NATO paying their fair share, and Trump is not necessarily NATO's biggest fan. Is that going to have an impact on NATO, NATO's collective security, and is that going to have an impact on whether Russia can be curbed if it's trying to extend its influence in Eastern Europe. It may have some impact. It's important, however, to realize that U.S. foreign policy in general and U.S. policy toward Russia in particular are uh, shaped by policies of the U.S. Congress or views of the U.S. Congress. Uh, U.S. allies have a significant influence in Washington and the U.S. president. So thus far, what we have seen is that since President Trump came to office, U.S. sanctions on Russia have been toughened. The United States is spending even more money on the European Deterrence Initiative, that is uh, supporting rotational U.S. and NATO troops in the Baltics, uh, Poland, and other parts of the world. So U.S. policy uh, it reflects a bipartisan consensus in the United States that Russia's aggression really deserves to be met with increasing costs to that aggression. Yeah, there seems to have been a consistency with the U.S. policy. And what's interesting is that that's at odds with the idea that some in the U.S. have that Russia put Trump in the White House. But that's another discussion altogether. Maybe we can have it another time. But William Courtney, Alexander Nekrasov and Ian Bond, I thank you all for joining us on The Newsmakers. Coming up on the program, this drug might be the best weapon against HIV, but could it cause other diseases to increase? And will Muqtada Sadr govern Iraq with Iran's help? I'll speak to former U.S. Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad. There's been a possible breakthrough in the fight against HIV AIDS, and it centers on a drug called pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. Researchers in Australia say the drug is causing the rate of HIV to go down. And here's the crucial part. Even though people on the pills are less likely to use condoms, 
That's been a huge concern for critics of PrEP, who say it gives a false sense of security. So has this new data calmed their fears? That debate in a moment, but first here's Haider Abbasi. This pill can stop the spread of one of the world's worst viruses. Studies suggest Truvada cuts the risk of contracting HIV by up to 92%. It's become popular around the world, especially among people considered at high risk, such as gay and bisexual men, and people who inject drugs. But a new study in Australia has found that the use of Truvada has led some gay men to stop using condoms altogether. It also says that gay men who weren't even on the drug stopped using protection too. Despite that riskier sexual behavior, the study suggests that overall HIV infections fell. So how does Truvada work? The drug stops the virus that causes AIDS from making copies of itself and spreading by protecting the body's T cells. Truvada is used as part of a preventive approach called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. But there's a catch. For the drug to be effective, it must be taken every day. We need to find a way that somebody who is otherwise healthy takes a pill every day to protect him or herself. And this is not for a month, this is not for three months, this is for years. And it can't protect against other sexually transmitted infections, such as gonorrhea and syphilis. Doctors say these are now on the rise. The World Health Organization says nearly 37 million people are living with HIV, and most of those are from African countries. This raises another issue. The majority of people using Truvada are white and middle class. The cost of 30 tablets can be up to $1,500. That's simply unaffordable for most people. It's an absolute scandal that the prices are so high that even wealthy national health services are saying they can't afford the costs of these drugs. And if a user of Truvada becomes infected with HIV, some scientists have warned it's possible that HIV could mutate to become drug resistant. So if it's not the magic bullet, as some might assume, could it unintentionally lead to more cases of sexually transmitted diseases? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined in Melbourne by Dr. Vincent Cornelis. He's a sexual health physician and the co-author of Australia's PrEP Guidelines. And in London, we have author and journalist Matt Cain, who's been using PrEP for the past few months. Gentlemen, good to talk to you. This is a fascinating discussion. Dr. Cornelis, let me start with you. Does PrEP work? PrEP works extremely well, Imran. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, PrEP is the most effective way that someone can protect themselves against HIV. Um, it's more effective than condoms in typical use. Uh, the problem with condoms is that um, effective use of condoms relies on someone putting on a condom at the time of sex. And as we all know, the time of sex can be a time when it may be difficult to put on a condom. Um, you know, often there can be um, some alcohol involved or it's late at night or it's dark or you just don't have a condom with you um, PrEP separates that. So with PrEP, you just take one pill in the morning and you take it when you brush your teeth in the morning and if you do that every day, then you know you're not going to get HIV. Okay, so Matt, I understand that you use PrEP, you like PrEP. Let me tell you what Michael Weinstein told me. I spoke to him a couple of years ago. He's from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, the head of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in LA. He told me PrEP was a bad idea. Why? Because it stops people from using condoms. And now we're seeing an explosion of gonorrhea and syphilis and, and so on. Do you have sympathy for that position? Do I have sympathy? No. Well, I think if we have a drug here that effectively vaccinates against a major lifelong and expensive to treat condition, we shouldn't not use that simply because it doesn't protect against much more minor infections that are very easy to treat with a course of antibiotics. I think what's going on here is a similar thing to what happened in the 1960s when the contraceptive pill was introduced and women were slut shamed and, um, you know, there was this narrative that it would encourage women to be promiscuous. Well, frankly, what's the problem if they want right. to be? And I don't feel like I should have my sex life or my um, habits 
criticised or morally judged. I think I'm right. doing the responsible thing by taking PrEP. And I don't think it has encouraged me to be any more promiscuous. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, let me ask you for clarity, how do you get your PrEP? Because I know it's quite expensive. I know in the US a lot of people can't afford it. How do you get it? Well, in the US, um, any gay men who have health care um, policies, insurance policies, they get it automatically on their policy. In, the, in Europe, it's still under patent, so it's very expensive, about £400 a month. But you can get it. In the UK, we have the National Health Service has a PrEP trial, which you can get it for free. I get mine via I Want PrEP Now, which is a website which sources it from other countries, like Thailand, in my case, where it's come off patent and is there for much cheaper, around £30 sterling a month. Okay, so Vincent, is that wise? Matt needs it, he gets it through Thailand. Is that, I don't know, something that you find normal and wise and acceptable? Yeah, so in Australia, we're quite lucky. We now have uh, PrEP on the government list, so people can access it here with fairly low costs. Um, but that is a fairly recent change. And prior to that coming in um, and prior to our large demonstration trials that we ran over the last few years, people were self-importing here as well. So people were ordering it online because otherwise it simply was not affordable. I mean, it's uh, about $700 per month to buy it privately. Um, so if, unfortunately, there are situations in which people need to buy it online. It's not ideal. Right. Um, obviously, there's a chain of custody issue in that it's just coming through the mail and you can't necessarily guarantee that um, it's been under ideal conditions during the transit in the mail. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, but unfortunately, that's something that people sometimes need to rely on. Okay, so, Vincent, to the Michael Weinstein point of things like syphilis and gonorrhea, the rates of gonorrhea infection among men who have sex with men have been climbing... It was at about 4% in 1989. It's at just under 40% now. That's not good. Now, of course, there are multiple factors. But do you accept that there's an argument from the other side to say, well, you know what? We just finally got ourselves into creating a condom culture. I remember in, in San Francisco when I was making a documentary about this, there were a lot of gay men who said, who were middle-aged, who said, we saw our friends die in the 80s because they didn't wear condoms and now they fear that all of this stuff might come back. There's a massive trauma connected to this. Is there validity to that yeah. argument? There, in a way, I mean, I think what's really important is to separate the two. So PrEP is HIV prevention and that's all it's ever claimed to be. And it's extremely good at doing that. It's not STI prevention. Um, condoms have played a very important role through the 80s and 90s and, and 2000s in preventing HIV and preventing uh, sexually transmitted infections. But they're not perfect at it. They don't prevent all transmissions of HIV and they certainly don't prevent all transmissions of other sexually transmitted infections. So syphilis and gonorrhea um, can be transmitted through uh, types of sex that, sex that don't normally involve condoms for example, oral sex, and uh, gonorrhea can probably be transmitted through tongue kissing as well. Um, and I don't know anyone who uses condoms for that. Um, so I think it's important that we conceptually separate these two. Mm -hmm. HIV prevention is one thing, STI prevention is a separate thing. And as a medical community, we do need to find better ways to prevent sexually transmitted infections other than HIV. OK. Matt, you want to jump in? Can I? Can I say something here? Yeah, um, STIs in general, things like gonorrhea and syphilis, were on the rise anyway before PrEP came into use. And actually, the amazing thing about PrEP is, if you think about um, the HIV AIDS crisis and the aftermath of it for a good decade after the combination therapy came in, when condoms were our main tool of preventing HIV infection, rates went up and up and up. And it's only now, for the first time since HIV AIDS was discovered, that rates of infection are plummeting. And there's parts of, San there's parts of the US, like San Francisco, for example, where they're almost at zero infection rate because PrEP use coupled with the, the shame and the stigma around HIV being diminished, and therefore people are more likely to test. And if they're positive, they're more likely to get on drugs. These drugs make them undetectable in, in case 
capable of passing it on. Okay. So if you've got those drugs and widespread testing on one on one hand and on the other hand PrEP, this is this is the the future for HIV prevention and it's really working in the way that condoms weren't. Right. This is the future and it's working. So then, Vincent, help me understand. If we have something that if you take it every single day, it works like a vaccination against HIV. HIV was a terrible tumor on, on the world for a long, long time. If we can win the battle against HIV with PrEP, why is it still so inaccessible around the world? And why are so many countries and their different health authorities still skeptical about it? I think, I mean, sex has always carried um, stigma. And unfortunately, um, that stigma has been translated to PrEP in some settings. We've been lucky in Australia that um, we've had a very strong grassroots support for PrEP here in Australia. And um, the community involvement in rolling out PrEP has resulted in the fact that we, we really don't have much PrEP stigma in Australia. But I know that situation is very different in, for example, the United States, where, as you mentioned, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation was very anti-PrEP. Um, and I think a lot of this pushback comes uh, from sex stigma. I don't think it's necessarily based in uh, rational health economics. Um, you know, from, uh, if we only looked at health economics, then it makes sense to prevent HIV infections because right. HIV infections are very expensive to manage. Um, so if we can have a drug that prevents them, then it makes sense for governments to support it. But okay. I think... Um, right, right, yeah. right. A final word from you, Matt. I was just going to throw in another word, um, as well as stigma, I'd like to throw in and suggest that the word prejudice is relevant here, because this is, HIV AIDS is still, in the West, a disease that disproportionately affects the gay community. And I think, you know, there is still the hangover of us being considered, in the 80s as we were, um, disease-carrying sexual mm -hmm. predators who weren't to be trusted. And I think this is still breaking down in some quarters of Western society. And I think this is partly what's at play. I think people are squeamish about combating it because they don't like to think about the reality of gay men having sex. Okay, yep. And it's been interesting getting your perspectives on PrEP. Thanks so much for joining us on the program, Vincent Cornelius and Matt Kane. We met to end the suffering of this nation and of the people. Our new alliance is a nationalist one and within the national framework. For someone who doesn't like Iran, Muqtada Sadr seems to like its allies quite a bit. Just weeks ago, the Shia leader was on the Iraqi campaign trail, doubting his independence from Tehran. Now in power, Sadr wants to form a government with the pro-Iranian Fatah alliance. So, could Iraq be under the thumb of the Ayatollah, or is Sadr just being a good politician? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, Afghanistan, and the United Nations, Almay Khalil Zad. Sir, pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. I'm curious to ask you about Muqtada Sadr. When you were U.S. Ambassador in, in office, he was one of your top enemies. He killed American soldiers. How do you feel about him in the ascendancy right now? Well, the past uh, was not a good one, uh, especially in the early years, uh, as you said correctly. Now, he has been on a journey and he has evolved. Uh, he has uh, sought improved relations with uh, some of the Gulf Arab states uh, and beyond uh, the Gulf. He said he wants to follow a policy of uh, nationalism independent of Iran. Uh, um, he wants uh, Iraq to be a regional bridge. Uh, he says he accepts the Constitution. He wants uh, a, a government that can address the needs of the people, uh, deal with corruption. If he actually behaves uh, as a part of the coalition, and it will take a long time probably for the government to be formed, then this would be progress. Uh, and and. Uh, it should be welcomed. Uh, mm -hmm. So we will have to wait and see uh, whether he delivers on the, on, on the new commitments and new messages that he is sending. Yeah, fascinating character. Nationalist, aligning with the communists and now pivoting towards those who like Iran more than he claims to like them. 
fundamentally, do you have a fear that Iraq would just become some sort of vassal state of the Iranians? Well, that, you know, all Shiite political groups uh, have uh, had good relations with Iran. Uh, some of them lived, uh, the leaders in Iran during the time of the opposition to Iraq, and the sectarian relations uh, are there. But I believe that they also mostly, not those who are on the pay of Iran, but most of the Shiite politicians would like to have good relations with the United States. They have told me that when I was ambassador, but then since as well. And they want uh, to, uh, to have good relations with other countries in the region because uh, uh, that is needed. A balanced policy is needed uh, for Iraq to succeed, for the communities of Iraq to right. come together. Uh, because if uh, uh, Iraq goes too far towards Iran, it will antagonize uh, others, Turkey, for example, or Saudi Arabia, and they can then in turn uh, work with groups inside uh, Iraq who are opposed to Iran, and that could lead to instability right. and even violence. So uh, a balanced approach is what Iraq needs, and uh, uh, Muqtada al-Sadr is speaking that language. He's talking the talk. We'll see whether he does the walk. Uh, should he be part of the government, which it looks likely, and right. the government is formed. Uh, Abadi defeated Daesh, one of the most egregious groups in modern history, yet he still suffered at the polls, which I guess is a scathing indictment of the man's leadership. Where do you think Abadi got it wrong? Well, uh, you know, sometimes uh, war presidents or leaders uh, tend to do badly afterwards in the polls. Uh, the U.S. experienced that after the Gulf War with President Bush, uh, who was uh, very high in popularity uh, during the war and immediately after uh, lost the election to President Clinton. And some, of course, uh, refer to Churchill also, who did uh, uh, badly in the polls after World War II. Uh, it, it is possible that, uh, that uh, since he was so focused on the war uh, and building regional relations and uh, repairing relations with the coalition, the U.S., that he perhaps, at least in the perceptions of some of the people in Iraq, didn't pay attention to the uh, right. domestic issues, uh, services, uh, corruption, uh, I know that those were part of his agenda, but the, uh, but the, uh, uh, the, perhaps in the eyes of the of the people, he did not adequately pay attention to to those concerns. And uh, uh, but he did, uh, you know, he's one of the top three. Uh, he, he, he may well uh, be part of the government. Uh, you know, he could even right. survive as a potential compromise candidate for prime minister, although. Many people say that's unlikely, uh, but uh, we will have to wait and see. He didn't do as well as he expected. Right. That is certainly true. Yeah, so as we look at it and we look at the candidates and we look at the ascendancy of someone like Sadr and we look at the, the, the many challenges facing Iraq and the mess that it's in in many ways, you have a few more white hairs than the time when you were in office or even at the time of the U.S.-led invasion in mm -hmm. 2003. Let's look at the big picture now, the big timeline. Fifteen years on, was it the wrong idea to go in and topple Saddam and invade and occupy Iraq? Well, I think uh, uh, that many people who uh, uh, made the decisions have said that if they knew and that Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction at that time, they wouldn't have done it. Uh, I uh, think with regard to Iraq and what has happened there, it is clear that uh, the coalition that went in, led by the United States, did make some mistakes that uh, uh, helped uh, in the development of the negative uh, events that occurred subsequently. I think the dissolving of the Iraqi army uh, was, a, was a mistake. Uh, the occupation establishment of an occupation authority was a mistake. Uh, I, I think that... Uh, uh, the Iraqi elite, uh, the political elite, also has to uh, take some of the blame for not coming together, for uh, 
uh, falling into the trap of sectarianism and being manipulated by uh, regional rivals. So there is a lot of blame uh, to go around for, for uh, the problems that Iraq has had since the uh, uh, invasion, although some say the roots of the problem go even further in, in the history of Iraq, how the borders of mm -hmm. Iraq were decided on by colonial powers. But uh, Iraq has made some progress. Uh, the indications are right now uh, uh, more positive. Daesh has been uh, defeated. Uh, um, uh, there, there was an election with all its problems and that they are looking at. Uh, and the challenge for the political leadership of Iraq is, uh, can they come to an agreement not only on a prime minister that can unite Iraqis, but also a, a, a platform, an agenda, that can bring the Iraqis together, whether they are uh, Shiite Arabs right. or Sunni Arabs or Kurds. Uh, so th that is a challenge. If they don't uh, do that, uh, if, if they go back to a sectarian approach or an ethnic uh, approach uh, that, doesn't, uh, that uh, does not unite the Iraqis, then, uh, you know, unfortunately, the future uh, would be problematic. They also need to address the domestic issues, internal issues of corruption, of services to the people. Uh, and, and Iraq has the potential uh, to be a very uh, well-to-do, promising country. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, they need to get their political act together. OK. Mr. Ambassador, Salman Khalilzad, a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. It's been good to talk to you. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Next time, as Turkey prepares for the polls, we take a look at the state of the opposition. Are they a united front? And how will they fare on Sunday's vote? Until then, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.